We're going to begin our afternoon with a presentation by Professor Alex Roberts. Alex is um, an associate professor here at the law school. She teaches and writes in the area of trademark law and also in the area of entertainment law. Um, she teaches trademarks, entertainment. She's taught a great course called Pop Culture and the Law at the main campus to undergraduates this year, which was really well received. Um, and also has an, an ex area of expertise in kind of law and, and literature. Her scholarship focuses generally on um, trademark use and distinctiveness, and she does some really interesting work also in um, focusing on social media and has a project coming up on influencers. Alex, we're really looking forward to your talk about failure to function. Thank you so much. Um, I am so excited. Let me just check time. So I know. Okay. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all today and excited that you're back on campus. Um, how many people here do trademark prosecution in the US? Yeah, litigation? Trademark work in other countries? Okay, fabulous. Um, so I've been working on this project for about two years. I actually started it when I was pregnant and my little girl's one and a half now. So it has been a labor of love. It's coming out, um, the final version, the end of this month, online and in hard copy. So I am really excited to hear your thoughts. And again, this is a, an area that's of very specific interest to me. So I think the conversations and the questions that we have today are probably going to um, push me towards some further future projects in that area. I'm going to try to talk really fast and leave plenty of time for questions and comments. And again, I want to hear about your experience uh, with this particular issue. So this paper is about, I already lost my clicker. My students love how I lose my clicker everywhere. OK. So this project is about use as a mark as a requirement for trademark protection. Um, it's a requirement that comes from the Lanham Act definition of what a trademark is and what a service mark is. And it's a requirement that comes from the common law. So rights require not just distinctiveness, not just use in interstate commerce, but use in a trademark way. Um, and that's something I think doesn't get a whole lot of attention. So everybody in this room knows about Abercrombie. I feel like my mic is coming in and out. Let's see if I can get it closer to my face. Okay, how's that? Cool. So we know about Abercrombie, um, and I think Abercrombie sometimes leads us in a direction that's really reductive, right? We ask, is it generic? Is it merely descriptive? Is it otherwise barred under Section 2A? No? All right, great. You have a protectable trademark. You can, you can move forward. So what I did in this project was really try to problematize that bucketing, that kind of assumption that there, that's all there is to it. So I start the paper with this story about a company called Cha Cha. Cha Cha applied to register successfully. Uh, haunted. Um, Cha Cha successfully registered 242242 as a service mark um, for basically texting questions and getting answers back. It was like an Ask Jeeves type of situation, and then a couple of years later got into a dispute with a competitor, and the competitor said, hey, look, I don't think, that, I don't think that's a good mark, right? We're going to challenge it on the basis that it's merely descriptive. And the board said, yeah, okay, but it doesn't identify an ingredient, quality, characteristic, function, feature, purpose, or use of the services, so it's not descriptive, so it's protectable, right? So there's a piece missing there. Because what we really should be asking, what trademark law expects us to ask, requires us to ask, is, is this something that consumers will perceive as a mark, right? What's the impression that it's going to make on consumers? So when we, when we only focus on that distinctiveness piece, we miss something really important. We're looking for that gestalt, because the crux of trademark law is consumer perception. And these two doctrines together help us predict help us um, figure out consumer perception, right? So use as a mark is a prerequisite for trademark rights. That's true for registration. We see this most often in the registration context. It's also true for litigation, for that threshold validity analysis. When an application doesn't show use as a mark, the USPTO says it fails to function. So I argue in the paper that use as a mark and distinctiveness are interdependent. They both ask whether consumers will perceive something as a mark, but they affect each other, right? Distinctiveness, inherent distinctiveness, and also acquired distinctiveness affects the use assessment. 
Um, and they, they both kind of interact in predicting whether consumers are going to understand something as a mark. So the solution is to consider them together, consider their interactions, right? It's especially true, I argue, for two categories. One is marks that are kind of borderline descriptive, right? They're like just a little bit better than merely descriptive. The closer they are to merely descriptive, the more robust kind of use they need in order to be perceived as a mark. And the other category is marks that are primarily something else. So a mark that's a phone number, a hashtag, a domain name, a catchphrase, a celebrity nickname, something like that, um, that may be perceived first as that other thing and only secondarily as a trademark. Those also need the most robust kind of use, right? Those are things to watch for. Those are things that are especially likely to fail to function. But of course, any kind of mark can fail to function. So what does use as a mark look like? It looks like a trademark doing its job. It's what you would expect, right? It's use as a source indicator. It's use that distinguishes goods and services from those of competitors. Um, it reflects the type of use that consumers will regard as a trademark use, which sounds totally tautological. But we're going to layer on some kind of concrete indicators in a minute. What does failure to function look like? It looks like use, as, uh, use on an invoice, as a business name, use as a book title. Um, use that's descriptive, like refreshing peppermint, pure and simple. Here's a couple of examples from the TTAB, recent examples. This one is where content reigns. Um, this one is semiconductor light matrix. So those were phrases that the board deemed to fail to function. <coughs> uh, spectrum is another one, right? A little bit more trappings of use there, but ultimately the court said, it just looks like it's describing, now with voltage control dimming and a spectrum of sunlight readable colors, just looks like it's describing the goods. It doesn't function in a trademark way. Um, I mentioned marks that are primarily something else. I've written extensively on hashtags as trademarks. So a couple of examples. Um, Magic number 108 is one I, I recently blogged about. I'll show you that image in a minute. Um, this is a specimen for a LexisNexis registration for hashtag be unprecedented. This one drives me particularly crazy. Hashtag share the silence, you can barely find it, right? It's down there uh, below the barcode, irestmycase.com. Kim Kardashian West has a bunch of registrations for her name, and sometimes she uses her name as a trademark, presumably, but plenty of other uses are not trademark type uses. And I think those can be difficult to distinguish. Make America Great Again, I just had a student, um, I supervised an independent study, a student wrote a really excellent note on the whole history of this set of registrations. Um, these specimens are also not particularly impressive. And then here's another um, model number case, this one out of the Sixth Circuit. So what do we talk about when we talk about use as a mark? What does use as a mark actually look like? Usually we're looking for stuff that's big, it's in a different color, it's in a distinctive font, so anything that really makes the matter stand out, right? And here, of course, I'm mostly focused on word marks, um, and we would need to think in kind of different conceptual terms in thinking about trade dress and logos and other types of marks. Some of these ideas will carry over. Stylization, uh, prominent placement. So Lee Christensen and DeRosia, and I'll talk about their work more in a minute, um, they write about how, depending on the goods and what they are, consumers know where to look, right? Know where to look. If it's a box of cookies, if it's a bottle of aspirin, if it's a t-shirt or a hat, we know where the trademark spot is. We know where, if you put something, people are going to say, oh yeah, that's the trademark. Um, typically, the, the matter is set off by itself. The use of a TM symbol or a circle R symbol can be helpful as a signal to consumers and then um, capitalization as well, right? So your Dunkin' Donuts, your Suave, your Coldies, and these examples cut across distinctiveness categories. So Coldies, for example, is a pretty descriptive mark, but when you put it in big font in different colors right in the middle, you really emphasize it and highlight it it's unambiguously clear to consumers that that's where the trademark is and that's what the trademark is. <clears throat> um, so this is the Lee Christensen and DeRosia paper, which is one of my favorites. So I think trademark law could and should benefit more from social science research, and it's not always listening, right? It's hard to kind of keep it fresh and keep it updated, but this research does exist. 
So in this study, um, a law professor, a former law professor who's now a judge, and a couple of business school professors um, randomly generated just a descriptive term to use as a fake trademark, and they mocked up these boxes. And they asked people, in the product package shown, is wonderful a brand name, it's not a brand name, or I don't know, right? So using all those kinds of indicia of trademark use that I talked about, big, it's got a special font, it's got a shadow, it's got an oval around it, all that stuff, 80% saw it as a brand name. So if we're thinking purely in terms of the Abercrombie categories, we would say, well, it's merely descriptive. Um, so people aren't going to understand it to be a trademark when they first encounter it. Obviously, there are other reasons not to protect merely descriptive marks from their very first use. There are policy reasons. Um, but these presumptions about how people view them, this study kind of um, really unsettled. right? So OK, so we take away the oval, we take away the shadowing, but we're still in that prominent spot, still pretty big. We get 70% think it's a brand name. So we can see that context plays a really significant role, that consumers understand what they're looking for. They're making these quick decisions. Um, and they will rely on these kind of contextual indicators to tell them where the trademark is. Once you take them away, so you shrink it down, and we, know, we don't have any special font. We don't have any, any of that interesting visual stuff going on anymore. Uh, and here in the last image, you can see Wonderful's all the way down in the corner, so it's definitely not in the trademark spot. The numbers go way down. So about a third of the people surveyed, um, which still is kind of shockingly high, right? People sometimes see these slides and they're like, who thinks that's a trademark? So um, a third or, or fewer than a third of people now think that Wonderful is a brand name. How am I on time? Sure. Uh, sometimes companies in Brazil, uh, they, they're not using the trademark, but they doing it just for defensive purpose in order to defend against non-use cancellation actions. Mm -hmm. So they use uh, the trademarks in the back of the product, you know, very tiny and small, with small letters, just to defend against non-use cancellation actions. So that's why I remember it, because when you use that last example, would that be recognized as a trademark to use here in the U.S.? It and probably would in cancellation. the U.S., right? Our requirements are different from almost every country in that we have this actual use and use in a trademark way, this set of requirements. It's not a registration-based system, um, even though we also have the ITU option. That said, most of the reason, most of the, the thing that motivated me to write this paper is that so many times this issue slips right by the PTO. Right? So it's really easy to find examples. Um, the USPTO refuses applications based on a failure to function less than 1% of a time. And then even within that set of trademarks where it, it issues initial refusals, more than half the time the applicant can then persuade it to change its mind. Right? So applicants then respond with um, different specimens or they just argue, no, actually, this is a trademark use. Don't worry. It's fine. Um, and they ultimately prevail most of the time. So I think um, the trademark examining attorneys aren't paying a ton of attention to this issue, so I can't give you a definitive answer, right? The use that you described sounds to me like not a legitimate use, not use in a trademark way that, that consumers are gonna notice and comprehend, but um, doesn't mean we can predict that the trademark examining attorney won't accept it. <coughs> Um, so without use as a mark, there's no mark, right? To the extent that this is mostly a registration issue, I think registration really matters. Registrations cast a big shadow. So when litigants show up in court and they bring their registrations with them, courts are pretty unlikely to reassess at that stage, right? They get that presumption of validity, and that presumption is strong and robust and, and treated often as broader than what... Um, it might look to us as experts like the registration actually covers. And then just thinking about registrations, I think registrations can have a lot of chilling effects and they also can provide a lot of fodder for bullies, right? So when I talk about chilling effects, I'm talking about competitors who are either choosing new marks, new entrants to the market, 
um, or even just using advertising language, marketing language, and feeling constrained in what they're allowed to say. Um, not even to mention consumers who have this understanding that they're not allowed to say certain things, right? So we see this sometimes in the news and responses to the news. So we see like news coverage saying Taylor Swift trademarked all of these song lyrics and then people are saying, oh, I'm not allowed to tweet this, I'm not allowed to post this on social media, I'm not allowed to say these words. And even though those are uh, misconceptions about trademark law, I think we kind of walk that line. And we saw that also with the US Olympic Committee um, when they came out and said nobody except our actual sponsors are allowed to use these hashtags, right, in connection with the Olympics a couple years ago. Um, and then when I talk about bullying, I think everybody has probably seen this in practice. So um, sending a cease and desist letter, appending a registration, appending multiple registrations, appending registrations and saying, not only do we have these seven registrations in all these categories, but they're incontestable. Right? So um, to the extent that you believe my argument that the PTO is granting protection for certain things that don't actually function as a mark, that aren't actually being used as a mark, then I think there are reasons for concern about that kind of overprotection. Um, so a couple of examples, I talk in the paper about kind of doing one without the other, right? Paying attention to use or distinctiveness rather than putting them both together. So the board in this case said the toilet button um, fails to function as a mark, but didn't bother to say the, a picture of a toilet is generic or at best very, very descriptive for a button um, on a call tool that you use to, to call for medical help using the toilet, right? And then conversely, um, distinctiveness without use. So the TTAB here said, well, freshherbs.com, that's just not distinctive. And what it didn't say is, it's just a domain name. It's not being used in a trademark way. It doesn't function as a mark. <coughs> so my solution, as I said, is taking distinctiveness and use as a mark together, acknowledging that each one informs the other. So this is a case um, and not everybody agrees with me on this. I, there are a couple of professors who are writing responses to my forthcoming article, and I know one of them disagrees with me on this case, but I actually think the board really got it right here. So the mark is Trulicity, right? You can see it right here. It doesn't have a whole lot of the trappings of trademark use that we talked about, right? Um, it has a capital letter, it has a TM symbol. Other than that, it's kind of used in the middle of a sentence. It's not a different color, it doesn't stand out. But the board said, look, Trulicity is a fanciful mark. It's a totally made up term. So it doesn't serve any other function here than being a trademark. And consumers know that. When consumers are looking at something like this and they see this word capitalized with a TM symbol that they've never seen before, they understand that's a trademark, right? Um, so the fact that the mark is fanciful means that it requires fewer of those indicia of use. It doesn't need kind of quite as much context for people to perceive it as a mark. And then conversely, this is just, um, I kind of searched around at random to find a bunch of specimens that I hated for this paper and they were so easy to find. Um, this is a specimen for a registration for chipset free charging. Can you find it? No, you can't find it. Okay, it's all the way down here. Chipset free charging, there is a TM symbol, like Trulicity. It does use capital letters, like Trulicity. But nobody's going to see that as a mark, right? It's so descriptive. It's right in there with the specs. It lo looks like it's telling you about the product. Um, so there, I think, because the mark is so descriptive, we're going to have to see a lot better trademark use. We're going to have to see it more like wonderful. It's got to be in the middle, in a different color, with a big circle around it, all that stuff, for consumers to actually think, oh, OK, this is the source indicator. This is the name. Do you have a question? Well, on the last slide, the one before, was that in a clinical trial? Was that a clinical trial label? Okay. Yeah. I remember it was clinical, because that's not how it is on the packaging at the end of the day. Right. Like, so this, is, yeah. this was a really early use, yeah. right? Um, and, and arguably, I'm sure the use improved and got better when they actually put it out on the market. A lot of those. <laughs> yeah. What's that? I submitted a lot of those clinical files for drug tests. So. Okay. So have you gotten that type of refusal? No, because there's a special exception for clinical trials. So that's. And I was wondering why, if that's why this one was allowed separately from everything else. I don't remember this particular the verbiage in the case. 
Yeah, there's not a lot of discussion of that yeah. exception um, in the opinion. Right. So they do look at the failure to function issue. Yeah. Food for thought. The the H nine X M C G B D G. Any thoughts there, and about whether that could be deemed use of a trademark? And the reason that is I, after clinical trials. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because uh, what I've seen, especially in the anti counterfeiting world, is a lot of electronics manufacturers are registering the model number of their product as trademarks with the USPTO. So they can stop it. So they can stop it as counterfeit goods. So it's not just the brand of the company of the products, the house mark that we're all used to seeing, but the specific model numbers as well are being given trademark protection. So. They are. I am extremely skeptical of a lot of those uses. Um, so the another one I showed earlier. So this one went up and back down. Um, and you get a, both a district court and, and a Sixth Circuit opinion that really focuses on descriptiveness, like the descriptiveness of a model number, even though the initial refusal at the USPTO said, this fails to function, this is just a model number. Um, so yeah, I think the likelihood that consumers understand that as a trademark is really low. As to what you said about the distinction between like the main house brand and everything else, I think most of the, the marks that fail to function are the everything else, yeah. right? So when a company is using something as its house brand, as its main mark, as the name of all its stuff, um, that's usually pretty clear. Those are usually pretty straightforward, pretty strong types of uses. Um, and the reason, the, or the types of cases where failure to function is much more likely to be an issue are all these kind of like peripheral stuff where companies are like, well, let's get, let's get everything. Let's just go look at our packaging and all the words and all the symbols and all the numbers. Let's just register them all, right? Which I think is not a great attitude. Um, and we can talk about where that attitude comes from. I sometimes say trademark registration is contagious. So I think that when companies look around and they say, well, our competitors are registering their hashtags, or our competitors are registering their domain, domain names, or um, you know, two different, many different versions of nearly identical marks, they have all these registrations. So we should do that too, because we need to keep up. Right? And there's not always like a really well thought out rationale for that approach. Okay, so the less inherently distinctive the matter is, or the more the matter already fulfills some other function, so whether that's being descriptive, or it's a serial number, it's a hashtag, it's a domain name, the more robust the use needs to be for consumers to perceive it as a mark. And conversely, the weaker the use is, the more inherently distinctive the mark that you're dealing with needs to be to get protection. So what does that solution look like in practice? Um, the last section of the paper, I turned to some trade dress cases and different jurisdictions' ap approach to assessing the protectability of trade dress. Because what happens is um, they tend to do a better job building in the use piece. Why? Because you can't really think about trade dress in isolation in an abstract way, right? You can't use those Abercrombie buckets for trade dress. You have to think about context. You have to think about how it's used and whether it's used in a way that consumers will understand to be a trademark use, right? So Seabrook has some good language. The fourth Seabrook factor, which is actually not always used, but when it is used, I think it's great. Um, Duraco, Knitwaves, this separate commercial impression language, right? So whether it was capable of creating a separate commercial impression, conceptually separable, likely to serve primarily as a designator of origin of the product. Um, so those pieces go together in the trade dress cases. This concern is folded in or baked into the inherent distinctiveness analysis. Um, so just a couple of examples here. The board said, no Wendy's. The shape of a Wendy's sign isn't conceptually separable from, doesn't create a distinct commercial impression that's different from the Wendy's sign itself, right? People aren't thinking about just that outline. Um, no chevron, the shape of what you call your pole spanner where people pump gas, they don't see that as a different thing from the version, the live version with all the stuff, with all the logos all over it, right? Um, this was a federal circuit case and the, um, the company was trying to register just the dropper and the droplet. And the federal circuit said, look, this is your logo. You have a registration for the whole thing. Nobody's viewing just the dropper and the droplet as a separate trademark, because you don't use them by yourself, by themselves. 
Um, and we also see that in some cases about word marks. So there are a couple that I cite in the paper where um, the attempt is to get a registration for a smaller piece of a longer phrase or a longer slogan. So the goals for this paper um, are really to convince stakeholders, USPTO, lawyers, judges, that use as a mark matters. It affects whether consumers perceive stuff as a trademark. Um, and registering matter that doesn't function as a mark has chilling effects and provides fodder for mark owners to bully others. <coughs> so I wanted to just start a conversation about how better to integrate it. When it is integrated, when it's done well, what does it look like? I'm going to stop there um, and take some questions. And, and I'm interested just in hearing about your experience with these types of refusals as well. Um, well, if we're, if we're talking about experiences, I did have a refusal where I tried to register a hashtag um, for a client. We did overcome the refusal. Um, but to be honest, it was because the examining attorney didn't really pay close attention to the specimen. There were a few uses of the term, and one was definitely not as a trademark. But in the same specimen, there absolutely was valid you know, trademark use. It was just a question of, I, I kind of had to go to a supervising attorney on that one. But, um, Eventually, we did get it through. I don't know, maybe they're not looking at it closely or too close. That's certainly possible, right? They have a big stack and they're moving really quickly. Um, and I think for the reasons I said, the hashtags can be tricky. So they're trying to assess whether something, whether consumers are going to understand something mostly as a hashtag. Like it's telling me to go online and join the conversation, it's telling me to use the hashtag or actually as a source indicator. Um, there's also some really interesting interplay in some of these cases with another kind of failure to function which the USPTO sometimes calls incapable informational matter, right? So this was a, a really recent case from March. Application to register, hashtag magic number 108, and this is the use right here. So this is a reference to the Cubs winning the series after a 108 year long drought. Um, and in the opinion, the board cites those cases like drive safely, and once a Marine, always a Marine, and Republican in name only, and these um, kind of informational matter refusals, is the informational matter doctrine, and the, court, the board says, look, um, lots of people are using this hashtag just to signal that they're Cubs fans, and it doesn't matter who came up with the hashtag, it doesn't matter who started it, the problem is now that it's in wide use, nobody's going to understand it to be a mark. Um, which of course is not consistent with tons of other decisions that the PTO has made, like hashtag TBT for wine, right? Hashtag TBT has got to be one of the most popular hashtags in the history of hashtag. Um, but there the PTO was able to say, look, it's being used in a trademark way. It's being used as the name of a kind of wine, so we're good. Um, so what was kind of interesting to me here was that um, the board didn't really think about the other kind of failure to function, which is, it's just ornamental, right? It's not a trademark use. Putting something on the front of a t-shirt is not a trademark use. Sometimes they slip through. Sometimes those specimens are approved, but they shouldn't be. So um, at the intersection of these two doctrines, which is what I'm trying to get at with this kind of scale, right? The more likely the mark is going to per be perceived as doing something else, being a catchphrase, being a hashtag, whatever, the more robust traditional use we need to see which we didn't see here. But that, that was the specimen? Yep. So the use on the t-shirt is certainly ornamental, but not the, the same hashtag above the t-shirt. You don't think so? I, I mean, I think that's maybe because I had to deal with that issue. But I, yeah, so, I, I right. so the exactly. examining attorneys do let a lot of those through. Well, to me, it just looks like a descriptor of, of which t-shirt it is. It is, but then you've got the, 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 the noun T for t-shirt right afterwards. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It looks to me like a little like the brand use. Yeah. So I, I, I'm okay with. No, I think that. you're right. I mean, that's consistent with what the PTO does. Okay. So not okay with the ornamental use on a shirt, but more okay with the website use that is letting you choose which shirt you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. This is working like 50 percent of the time. Okay. So I just had this after as examples where I think. Hashtags in some cases really are used in a trademark way, right? In a traditional trademark way. So nobody would question that hashtag get fried is the name of this restaurant and is functioning as a mark just because it has a hashtag on it. 
Um, but when you switch to those online uses, you're much more likely to, um, I think, have a failure to function. Yeah? How does acquired distinctiveness come into your analysis? Because you're talking a lot about apparent distinctiveness. Yeah. And then the trade dress, which of course kind of suggests the acquired distinctiveness. But what about something like Weight Watchers? You can saw that on your deck a few slides back. How does that factor in? That's a great question and one that I haven't fully thought through. So I did focus on inherent distinctiveness for this project. Um, and I absolutely agree that when consumers are already aware of something, then the bar gets much lower, right? They don't need that same kind of really clear, straightforward trademark use when they already know something is a mark. And in that way, it kind of resembles the um, secondary source doctrine, right? So even an ornamental use that we would consider not a real use as a mark is going to be okay if it's, a, if it's GAP, if it's University of New Hampshire, if it's a mark that we know people are already aware of. Yeah, so, I, so the reason I didn't focus on it was because it seemed like less of a concern with marks that have acquired distinctiveness. But how all the pieces fit together seems like a more complicated puzzle that I might want to spend more time on. Any more questions? taglines, corporate taglines, those may not be necessarily in every product because nowadays US PTO asking that every product should bear the mark in itself and show the evidence of the product in itself. We are facing some challenges now in US PTO. So one of my clients, their irrigation company, uh, they have this tagline, more, more crop per drop. Okay. And they have around 1,500 products. Mm -hmm. Those products are um, small mi <coughs> micro spray to you know the pipes and all. Now, in all these products, they cannot have these taglines, um, you know, printed on of them. So we are facing challenge in USPTO now that how to show that this tagline is printed on the product. So the the PTO is requiring use uh, across. All of the products for which protection is sought? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you mean audits? Do you mean like the random audits? They want on the product, work? printed on the product. Now it's a tagline of the company, and the company uses it in all its brochures, in its website, and all. They're rejecting those things. They said website usage is not acceptable. Uh, on your brochure, is not acceptable. It has to be on the product. What's Not, well, it shouldn't be that straightforward, clear cut. I mean, if you've got a catalog or a website and you can they're actually not, buy they're it. Not accepting it. <coughs> they're accepting it for some categories of goods and services and not for others? Sorry? Are they, are they accepting those types of uses only for certain categories of goods and services and not for all of them? No, they're not accepting them at all. They still have to show the product. But is it for, is it for product lists of goods and services? Yes, it is for the products, but but it is a tagline of the company. It is not specifically for any one product, and there are fifteen hundred range of products. Yeah. Well, so since you have an environmental control apparatus, so it's a goods, and they're rejecting what you're submitting as specimens as mere advertising material. Yes. And so your options are if your client sells does the electronic point of sale, like the hashtag whatever 108 t-shirt thing, mm -hmm. if they have an electronic point of sale and you can show three things, the mark, a picture of the goods if associated where the consumers would see it in a cart, boom, you're good on electronic point of sale. <coughs> or, I mean, I had a client, so they sold with, with goods and, and uh, environmental control apparatus, and we literally had had it printed on, we did have it printed on the product in little packages or in a user manual. If you have an installation manual to go with the product, that is perfectly acceptable. So the installation manual that is yeah. distributed with the product will also work. We are a B2B yeah. company. Um. <laughs> so you cannot show those online sales. Okay. That's a, that's a challenge again. So the installation manual the is installation. here. It would be your instruction. <laughs> yeah, so, so working on this project was challenging because use means so many different things, right? So we have a use in interstate commerce requirement, um, and then we have an affixation requirement, which is really yes. kind of technical, um, and, it, and is the basis for plenty of refusals, right? Which is you're not, you're not using it on the specific products, it's not kind of closely enough attached. 
Um, and I, I had, this paper was like twice as long and I cut half of it. Um, but the piece that I was focusing on was, all right, you've got an interstate commerce and you're affixing it, arguably, and then are you using it in a way that consumers are going to perceive it to be a trademark? But I think you're absolutely right that it's kind of, um, all these pieces come together. And so it can be difficult to tease them apart. Not only that, the examining attorneys don't always talk about them in a consistent way. So they might issue a refusal that, you know, one would call it a failure to function and somebody else would call it a specimen refusal based on a failure to affix properly. Um, and somebody else would say, well, you're not really using it in commerce with these goods, only with those goods. So the fact is that the, the same issue can kind of go by different names. Oh, we're good. I think I heard him say we're good. Okay. Thanks, AJ. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon panel on challenges and opportunities around the world. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, trademark prosecution and some new law changes and some other issues that are coming up around the world. And uh, we're going to start by introducing everyone on the panel. Um, actually, I'll start with me because I might as well. I've got the podium. Uh, my name is Ashlyn Lumbry, and um, many of you have already uh, saw me introduce myself earlier. I work here at UNH School of Law. I'm a professor, and I run the Intellectual Property and Transaction Clinic, uh, where we represent clients pro bono. <laughs> Viani? Do you want to tell everyone who you are? Just introductions at this point. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Vianney Romo. Uh, I was class of 2006, actually Ashlyn's first class. Uh, I work at Romo de Vivar VIP Services in Mexico, my firm. And I'm very happy and thrilled to be here with family. Hi, everyone. Dana Sopardo. I am of the class of 1990. Uh, I have been practicing IP law for 30 years in the private practice and uh, during the last three years I, I have been with the government as president of the Patent and Trademark Office in Argentina. Hello everyone, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Jessica Xu and I'm from Beijing. Uh, I'm the managed partner of Beijing Siegfeld uh, inter uh, Intellectual Property uh, Agent. Uh, I am the LLM 2012, uh, so happy to be here. Hi all, I hope you all had your coffee and you will stay awake with us. <laughs> Um, I'm Mahua Roy Chodhri. I'm a graduate of 2001. We can't forget that year when September 11 happened. And we all went back home. And that's the best thing which I think could have happened. I have a law firm now, Royce & Co. And keep coming over here, but it's always nostalgic to come over here. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarkis Kiyajan. I'm from Armenia. Um, I think the only Armenian that graduated uh, Franklin Pierce or UNH School of Law. I'm a graduate of 2009. Uh, it has been 10 years. <laughs> so it's my first uh, visit after my graduation to U UNH, and it's very nice to be here. Um, I'm an IP attorney, uh, managing partner of Kinyazan Partners IP law firm, uh, the chairman of the Intellectual Property Rights Center of Armenia, and a uh, lecturer at the American University of Armenia. Great. I'm so happy to have you all here. Uh, clearly a, l a lot of expertise, and you all will hear some a, a lot of expertise from them as uh, they present. Just to give you an idea of um, the format we're going to follow, I'm going to um, we're going to have each speaker take 15 minutes, and then I'm, I was thinking we could um, reserve uh, substantive, large-scale questions for after all the speakers. I just know they they put in a lot of time for your presentation for, to present to you all to give you updates on the law, and I want to make sure they're able to cover that because there's a, there are a lot of new changes um, in their countries. All right, so um, just to give you an idea on trademark filings, we're at about 12 million a year according to WIPO statistics. That's from 2017, the most uh, recent publication. China has 46.3% of the 12 million filings. Um, uh, and so Jessica is going to talk about why that's the case. Um, the United States is second with 5%, with 5%. So um, 
we have about, the United States has about 600,000 applications a year measured by class. Um, I was recently at the USPTO and Director Peters predicted that would be on the rise for the next four years. So that is predicted to increase in the United States. Um, you can see here the other countries who are in the top uh, six or so offices. Um, moving to some other offices, um, uh, Mexico is one that's up 7.2%, and Vianney is going to be talking about Mexico. In Argentina, um, Damaso was able to supply us with some statistics for total trademark filings, around 100,000 a year. Um, and then, um, and uh, I don't know, did any of you want to speak to the statistics in your country? Is No, just we'll wait for later. Um, then some of the industries that are hot industries include um, agriculture in China and otherwise um, clothing, leisure and education, research and tech are hot areas as well as um, to a lesser extent uh, health and business services. And um, the, in the other interesting thing um, is that Madrid filings are an increase. Um, there are there's a 7% increase in 2017 over prior years and so now according to WIPO well at least in 2017 there were 57,000 international registrations that were registered um, <clears throat> so that shows an increase in Madrid I don't know about you all but um, I'm certainly using it more myself um, so so we're gonna just without further ado proceed on to Vianney's presentation about Mexico Thank which you. is Certainly a hot topic, and I think Vianney wanted to come up here. Is that no, right? no okay. you I'll, just I'll, want the clicker? Yeah, I just want the clicker. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Well, so thank you everybody for uh, keeping us with us after lunch. I know it's hard, but we can do it. Um, I'm very honored to be here in this panel. Thank you so much to everybody. Um, it, it was a great effort uh, to put this together so that everybody could have like an, up, an international update. So thank you, Ashlyn, for that. Um, so I'm going to talk about Mexico. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of the recent changes that we have been experiencing. But I'm going to take tell it like a story, because it's, it's worth it. Um, so we've had a lot of changes in our government. Um, first of all, last year, we had an amendment, a very big amendment, to the trademark chapter um, it was on August 10, 2018, and um, so the big part of the amendment was that in the past, trademarks were considered to be uh, any distinctive sign that was visual. Right now, it, that, ch that word was changed to perceivable through the senses. So um, why do I say that I'm going to tell this like a story? Because um, I know that uh, <laughs> perceivable uh, trademarks should include tactile trademarks, and yet they were not included. So it was kind of funny what um, the authority thought it would be deemed to include in the amendment to the law and what wasn't. But what was was uh, sound and smell trademarks. It's new signs. Tactile were left, never mentioned. Uh, basically, the background was, well, how many tactile trademarks do you know? Uh, how many registrations are there? So they just decided like not to cover them. And uh, they included holographic, trade dress, and certification trademarks. Now, um, most of these signs for most countries are very standard procedure. For us, it was like a very big change. I mean, if you consider that in the past we only had visual trademarks, that was word marks, um, logos, combination uh, marks, and three-dimensional forms, or whatever combination you could find within those. Now we're talking about um, smell trademarks, or we're talking about uh, sound trademarks, which were not in our usual practice. So 
we raised every single question starting from how do we file them because in Mexico we have application forms that are like very strict that they need to be filed in exactly the way the authority wants you to file them uh, to the point that for example a design trademark has to be a number of centimeters high and wide and things like that so we had a lot of questions obviously um, so it was included and then um, holographic trademarks in the past were forbidden to be registered as trademarks and now it's okay to have them registered as trademarks so we were like okay so how do we file a hologram do we file them like uh, in all of its views layer by layer how do you want them and we did not find any answers so we had to go to the international practices to see how was it done um, then we had um, the trade dress, which for most people is very common. In our case, what we did in the past with trade dress trademarks was that we filed them usually as design trademarks. What we used to do was taking pictures of a place, taking pictures of the product or whatever, just like put a big label and just said, okay, so the complete thing is the trademark. But it was very hard by the time that we needed to file, for example, um, to prove use or whatever. So um, now we already have the trade dress. And right now, uh, it is literally set forth in the law as a plur plurality of operative elements. OK, so operative elements. There is, I can tell you that in the amendment, no part where we have a definition of operative elements. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to tell you why is this in just a few slides. Um, image elements included among others size, design, color, disposition of form, label, packing, decoration, or any other that will combine distinguishes products or services. That sounds pretty standard to everybody that handles trade dress, but still leaves the question of the operative elements. So what do we think about those? If we don't have a definition, how are we going to enforce them? What are we going to do when we have, uh, let's say, somebody um, copying our trade dress? <coughs> now, moving on to, oops. It's, it not it's here. Okay. okay, so these are three examples of the trademarks that were filed. The second the amendment was uh, set into circulation. Um, those three were filed on the very first day and now are registered as trade dress. And then we go to certification trademarks, which are also new in our law. Now, certification trademarks have a big uh, problem right now in Mexico because, okay, they were really need needed. As we have, as all countries, entities that do certification services. But they had to register in Mexico like if it was a standard trademark. So how did you prove use, right? So they had common trademarks for certification. So it was kind of complicated. Um, Mexico already has uh, appellations of origin and geographical indications. So in the past, sometimes they were confusing certification trademarks with this. And now we have them split. So we have very distinctive um, definitions for each one. So now we have to deal with what is what. However, within the certification, you can include territory as a part of the process of certification. So it's not um, either one or the other. Sometimes there are like weird combinations that are left for interpretation of the law. There are classification issues. So as I understand, here in the US, you can file for a certification trademark for classes A and B. As I understand, it's That's like true. products and services, right, yes. Aslin? Yeah. Yep. OK, so um, in Mexico, they do not know exactly where, in what class the certification uh, marks should be classified and they are including all of them in class 42 uh, because 
the NIST classification says that certification services fall in class 42 and we're like, okay, so basically you're saying that a, I don't know, like a meat or an electric device is the same thing as a professional certification, right? They're all in the same class. <laughs> that is a huge problem. And it is a very, very uh, ongoing conflict with the trademark office because they are very, very insistent on this point. They want every certification trademark to be classified here. My perspective, and I share this with a lot of colleagues, I hope that the ones that are here agree with me, <laughs> is that um, apparently, because of the lack of experience with this kind of trademarks, is that the trademark office is confusing a standard trademark that covers certification services with a certification mark, which are different things. So uh, that's only my point of view. And um, so that's right now the challenge that we're facing. OK, and now here is the very, very big problem of everything, the trade dress, the certification, and all the lack of definition that we have. Technically, the regulations to the law were supposed to be issued at the same time of the amendments. However, due to the timing, come on in, <laughs> go, 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 go. <laughs> due to the amendments, that was not possible. Why? And this is part of the story. So these amendments were discussed by um, the authority and some of the private sectors. Uh, INTA was invited, AMPI, the local IP association was invited, ACP was invited. There were a lot of associations invited to just you know comment on the amendments. So by the time the exercise was done, the legislative process was already about to close in Mexico. So um, they were able to file for the amendment, but the regulations were not in time. So we were left without regulations. And what happened next is that by the time the next legislature came into ef effect, uh, we had a change of government in Mexico. If you all know that we just uh, had elections and uh, Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Lopez Obrador won, and he's right now our president. But the bad thing, the poor thing about this, yeah, I'm sorry about the commercial, but um, the bad thing about this is that in Mexico, most uh, institutions like the Ministry of Economics and everything, they are not granted because of academy or because of you know, experience or whatever. They are political charges. So when Bill Hennessy was talking about sometimes, uh, uh, like in China, that the career of law was in the same specialty as politics, it is true for Mexico. So um, imagine that you have a new law with no regulations and a new legislature. And then you have a new president who just changed the director of the trademark office, the director of the copyright office, uh, People are changing, coming back and forth from the Supreme Court, from the federal courts, and everywhere. In Mexico, we have a saying uh, that goes something like, uh, Mexico remakes itself every six years. Because every time we have a new president, uh, like all the positions are changed. So they have to figure out what happened before, what are they doing, and what it is moving forward. So that's what happened. So now we do not have regulations. And all we are stuck with is a bunch of questions about the interpretation. So we don't have a classification for the certification trademarks. We don't have a description for operative elements in the trade dress. We don't have a lot of things. We don't know why they didn't include tactile trademarks. Uh, and just we know as a hearsay, not because we actually read it somewhere. And Mexico is a civil law country, let's not forget about that. So supposedly, it is all supposed to be written, and we cannot find it anywhere. So 
this lack of regulations comes into play into a much, much larger issue that I'm going to explain next. So if we have new trademarks, let's see, obviously we have new refusals, right? Uh, if in the past holograms were prohibited, it was a refusal, and now they are allowed, uh, obviously the chapter of refusals was obviously changed. So now we have, um, for example, a prohibition for public domain holograms, who nobody knows who th what that is, again, because lack of regulations. And how does a hologram become public domain where in the past they were prohibited? I mean, there was no chance for them to become public domain. So I guess that this is for generations to come. Um, then there are uh, provisions for personal rights, like you know, like uh, image, voice, uh, names, so on and so forth. They were included in the past, but they were not like very, very well explained. At least this time around, they did a good job explaining them. Um, there are also provisions for copyright. Like for example, uh, in the past, you could not copy. Well, you could not use the title of any like works of art. But imagine that, um, I don't know, your trademark is called love. Do you know how many songs there are that are, uh, have love in their title in Mexico? Actually, here in Franklin Pierce, I had a challenge by one of my uh, colleagues saying that all songs in, in Spanish said something about love or, I, or heart or something like that. And I was like, yeah, we're lovable people. What can you say? <laughs> so. Um, Imagine if every trademark that included the word love was subjected based on copyright. I mean, that's just impossible. So uh, what they did is they tried to, you know, kind of uh, try to amend the prohibition and now they say, okay, for example, if you have um, some important aspect of Star Wars, let's say Chewbacca, that's what you cannot uh, use as a registration because Chewbacca, everybody would think it's something about Star Wars. So they, they were more concrete. Um, they also included um, plant varieties and names of animal races, except when combined with other elements that are made distinguishable. And finally, we made our very, very first attempt at prohibiting uh, whatever takes uh, with bad faith. Finally, I know that I'm yeah. running on time, but this is where I want to go. Yeah. Everybody okay, wants to hear that. so exceptions. Acquire distinctiveness or secondary meaning. We did not have that. It's very standard for everybody, not for us. And coexistence and consents. In the past, there was a time that they were even um, rejected because they were not in the law. Finally, and this is where everybody is um, a little bit confused, uh, we went back to the dark ages with the statements of use. I'm just going to, I just want to explain why. So we have this um, problem in Mexico that it's being called, uh, I don't know why, I hate it, I hate the name, the kidnapping of trademarks. So a person goes to another country, sees a trademark that they like, go back to Mexico, register that in its name, whatever, and they are calling that trademark kidnapping. Um, okay, so there are tons of trademarks, but like, I mean, thousands of trademarks that were registered like that, or simply trademarks of companies that just started out registered their trademarks and never got to use them because in Mexico use is not required to apply or even achieve registration. However, use it is a source of rights. We have a combined system. So imagine you have trademarks that are just there for 10 years just in the middle of your registration and what could you do about them? So we had bunches and bunches of citations of trademarks that nobody had that you could not file their, their uh, owners uh, not even the, their uh, attorneys could find the owners, um, so on and so forth. But they were just in the middle and your only options were to challenge them. And you have to waste a very uh, expensive 
uh, litigation just to get them out of the way when you know that nobody wants those trademarks. So the trademark office says, you know what? Let's get rid of everything. That was the purpose. Let's get rid of all those trademarks that are just abandoned, just hanging in there, like in a kind of a limbo, and let's give the rights to the people that are actually exploiting trademarks. So it was a good intention, but, but as they say, hell is filled with good intentions. So by the time they tried to put that into words and into the law, it kind of changed everything because right now you have to declare the effective use of your trademark at the third year after you get registration. And then by the time that you renew, you have to prove your use again. I mean, by proof, you don't have to submit like, you know, a sample of it or whatever. You just have to declare that the trademark has been in effective use. However, remember, you're declaring this before a federal authority. So if your declaration tends to be not completely true, that is a crime. So far, no lawyer in Mexico has attempted to use the criminal law on this, but it's still there. Until now. Until now. You're right. Um, so that's right now what's going on. But then the question was, OK, so that is as of August 10. What happens with all the trademarks before that? OK, so we have two versions. The first one, the blue one, is the panic version. That's what I call it. The panic version says that if your filing date is any before August 10, you need to file a statement of use immediately. And then you have to file it with a renewal. That's the panic. Um, my opinion and the one that I'm sharing with a lot of colleagues that, that we've studied deeply this and we know what the background and the bottom of this uh, requirement was, is that prior to a filing date prior to August 10, 2018, they have to file their statement on, of use until their next renewal. Why? Because our constitution says that you cannot ask for a new requirement to any person under the law. And that includes trademark applicants from whatever. It is a principle, a constitutional principle. So the law cannot go beyond the constitution. Again, we have no regulations. But, and that's where the interpretation is. So people that are just wanting to do the things on the safe side are just filing on the, just filing date, whatever. They're just presenting their statement of use. It doesn't hurt. I mean, nothing will happen. But uh, most people are filing them with the next renewal. For Madrid protocol applications, um, it doesn't matter that your trademark is already registered in whatever countries. The second an international registration hits Mexico, it becomes an application. So it only has to do these requirements until it becomes a registration. So if it was prior to August, it's the same rule by the time of renewal. If not, then on the third year. So that's, that's it for me. I, I guess that we'll leave the questions for uh, later. I'm sorry, Damaso, that I took so long. Um, but that was important. Thank you. Thank you, Can you stand up here? Sure, 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 sure. However you're more comfortable. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I really would like to pray, uh, pay a tribute and uh, mention my mentor and great person, uh, Carl Jordan. Uh, he was really a great man, a great professor, and uh, with his career and his uh, life, he inspired many of us. And uh, so we remember uh, Carr uh, 
always, and uh, Alice, uh, his wife, who is still alive. For us, the experience of uh, study abroad, for many of us, is one of the most important experiences in our life. We were listening to this morning to our dean mentioning something about that. And uh, it uh, really changed completely our life, the way we see the world and things, uh, uh, because having an experience in a country abroad uh, really produced that in any person. And it's, uh, it's a tremendous uh, experience to see in front of me many of uh, one of my good friends whom I met in 18, 1989. Uh, Mladen Bugmir, uh, Louis Schmidt, Carlos Utov, he's not here, uh, Jose Grasarana, and Jim Sullivan, a JD student who is a great uh, friend of mine. So, uh, I also very happy to realize that uh, Megan and many of the new professors, Ashleen also, really value the, the precious legacy that they inherit uh, from uh, Franklin Priest Law Center. And I, I hope this, this tradition continue to be a kind of small personalized institution where we really f feel at home. No? Uh, during the lunch, the, the, the tribute uh, one of the students or uh, alumni paid to uh, Jane, it was incredible. But it's, it, it was like this. I mean, we, we arrive every morning and she mentioned and say, hello, Damaso, hello, John. And still remembering the name of each of one of us, I, I think she's almost 98 years old. I, I, I would like to have his... Uh, uh, to be healthy as her if I get to this age. And uh, last, I, it's, a, it's a very nice coincidence because uh, I got married in 1989 and came with my wife uh, to do this master's degree. She also studies and went to UNH. Uh, she did a master's in nonfiction writing, and uh, we ended up being alumni of the same institution. So it's a, it's a very interesting story. And uh, more interestingly, she is uh, today with me. She, she came uh, to this uh, day in Franklin Pierce. So I am really, very happy. Um, well, after practicing 30 years as an IP lawyer in private practice, litigating and prosecuting trademark uh, patents and so on. Uh, in 2016, I was uh, appointed president of the Patent and Trademark Office in Argentina, uh, a very challenging uh, opportunity to contribute a little bit with uh, our country uh, in a, in a subject which uh, I'm, I consider to be an expert. So uh, when we uh, took office, it was really uh, a mess. It was an office which was, uh, had a lot, a, a lot of backlog, particularly in the patent area, more than 30,000 patent pending application. Uh, the timeline from study uh, patent applications, particularly in the pharmaceutical sector, was between 8 and 12 years. Um, there was no uh, e-filing uh, in place. Uh, well, there was really a very difficult uh, situation. So we, we uh, draft a strategic plan to the minister for four years basically with three main objectives. One was to uh, modernize the office, uh, the regulation, the proceedings. Uh, the second part was to uh, work toward the integration to the world. So we made a lot of cooperation agreement with all the patent office of the most important patent office, like USPTO, EPO, the Chinese patent office, the Korean, uh, with many of them, we signed PPH agreement to try to expedite, expedite the, the, the study, uh, substantive examination of the patent application. We have uh, not only the responsibility to uh, manage 
a patent and trademark office with uh, 500 people and 100,000 application, trademark application per year, but also to uh, be the consultant, the main consultant uh, of the government in the trade agreement, because uh, contrary to our neighbors, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, during the last decade, Argentina was not uh, signing any agreement. We have to do that within the Mercosur bloc, which is Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina. And uh, we are going to sign soon a trade agreement with the European Union. We are going to close soon an agreement with Canada. And we are negotiating with many countries, South Korea, Singapore, and others. And that was a very uh, difficult uh, and challenging uh, situation because you have to first agree with your four, uh, the other three partners in each position, you know. And these negotiations are not uh, something very fancy. It's a very boring situation. Any, any of you who practice law would uh, immediately realize. I mean, you have to be sitting down from nine to six uh, uh, during one week, you know, uh, saying, well, this, this paragraph, let's change that because it's not consistent with our law or the Paraguayan. So very difficult uh, traveling to Brussels at least 10 times in the last two years. Uh, but very interesting because uh, we finally will be uh, at least uh, doing business with 30% uh, with, uh, of the uh, um, GDP, which is the European Union. Um, we basically, uh, in terms of uh, regulations within our country, we managed to uh, reform our patent trademark and design law. Uh, the, the, law the new law is called Law 27444. Um, the main change were in the, in the trademark area and the trademark opposition procedure. Uh, as you can recall, our former law was from 1981, and we have a very uh, complicated opposition procedure by which there were two stages, an administrative stage and the judicial stage, um, meaning that uh, you file the trademark applications, then the application is published <coughs> for 30, 30 days, one month, open for oppositions, and if an opposition was file, then the applicant and opponent has one year term, had in the past, one year term to negotiate an agreement by limiting the scope of the trademark application to certain goods, excluding or buying the trademark of the other party or a coexistence agreement, whatever way of uh, solving the dispute. In case they, they do not agree, it was the applicant, and I was describing the, the former uh, trademark opposition procedure, it was the applicant who has to file a lawsuit with a fair loss. Then he has two possibilities because there was a first and a second instance. So making the long story short, and I'm going right now to the, to the second uh, slide, which is the most relevant part of this presentation and will be most relevant for you so you can take some information about how the procedure works, works now. You can get up to, you can wait, have to wait up to four years to have a trademark registration if you have an opposition. You can imagine in the e-commerce uh, era, you know, internet, uh, fourth industrial revolution, I mean, no way. Well, the reform basically uh, is, uh, the, these slides show a, a kind of comparative uh, 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 part of each uh, step of the procedures. Uh, first of all, now the opposition is filed electronically, and we, we, we have uh, now, uh, we have an electronic filing system in the trademark uh, area 
a division, there are almost 65% of the application f electronically filed, uh, but all the opposition has to be filed electronically. And uh, you have to uh, set up uh, a name and address, an email, email address where you will be notified also electronically. And you have to file the grants from the, for the oppositions. That, that is not different from the other system. What we did, we reduced the one year term to three months and we set up a kind of uh, contentious uh, administrative procedure because it's not a, a, a legal proceeding. Uh, but the trademark office now decides on the merits of the opposition, whether the opposition, the opposition has been well grounded or not. So uh, after the three months, if the opposition is not settled, it is the opponent, and this is another very relevant change from the former procedure, as, as you, if you realize when I mentioned that, now, before was the applicant who has to file the lawsuit, who has to, has the burden to, you know, um, move in the procedure. And now is the opponent, you know, in order to balance the power between applicant and opponent, who has to ratify the opposition and pay an official fee, which is not very much, but it will be between, I think it's $250. And then if he, if he, when he ratifies, he will have the chance to enlarge the grounds and uh, file evidence uh, regarding his position on why he sustained that uh, the opposition should be maintained. Uh, so basically, once uh, he, finish uh, doing that, we will uh, notify the applicants about that and give the applicant 15 days to answer and file in evidence stage. The, the, the evidence stage will not be more than 40 days. And both parties will have a, an opportunity to file final arguments if they wish. And then, the decision will be taken by the trademark office. If any of the party is not happy with the, the decision, they will file an appeal. They will be able to file an appeal to the second instance uh, chamber of appeals with the federal courts. So, or no? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, okay, we are gone, sorry. I tried to go back, but I pushed the Is this out to see button. if everybody's still awake? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, um, if you see in the slides, on the left, you see four years, and on the right, you see 12 months. So, now a trademark application with an opposition will be uh, sold in not, not more than one, one year, which is really a, a very important uh, reduce in, in time. Yeah. A trademark application without opposition will be sold uh, in less than that, but this is... Well, this is a uh, kind of uh, information about the, 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 fi the amount of filings. It's interesting in, uh, in trademarks, uh, we have a, a, a very large number of trademark applications per year. And if you compare the amount with uh, Mexico, I think it's 160,000. Brazil, 140,000. But Brazil is, uh, and Mexico are three times uh, larger in population. I mean, we are 45 million people. There is something very uh, strange <laughs> about trademarks and the Argentinians. I mean, they like to file <laughs> trademark applications. Unfortunately, the, the, the patent application has been uh, decreasing. And uh, industrial design normally maintain the same number per year. Um, well, this uh, reform of the law also applies to patents. Uh, it, it, it didn't affect too much, but uh, one important change in the patent uh, prosecution is that we reduce the, the time or the deadline for filing you know, a substantive examination 
Originally it was three years. Now we reduce it to 16, 18 months, sorry, one year, uh, one year and a half, in order to expedite also the, the proceeding. Uh, we are more flexible with the translation of the certificate of priority rights. Uh, well, very important power of attorney normally used to be, uh, you know, sign and then notarize and then provide with the apostille, a very complicated and, and costly procedure. Now, simple sign is enough for patents, for trademark, and for designs. This is in the TLT and PLT treaties. We didn't sign this treaty, but we, we provide this, uh, this possibility through the amendment of the law. Um, well, and in terms of reducing the time for, for studying the patent uh, application, of course, we filed PPH, but we issue also a, a resolution, resolution 56, which is applicable, applicable to any country of the world who has the Paris Convention and the three main uh, requirements for patent application, which is novelty, industrial application, and an uh, invented step. So anyone who has a patent application who was granted or is ready to be granted in a foreign office and uh, has a patent application, a corresponding patent application filed in Argentina covering the same scope of the claim, can ask for this uh, expedite uh, procedure and the, the patent office has to um, respond in 60 days, in two months, and then do the ex substantive examination, which is mostly done because the patent has granted in the EPO, the USPTO, or other important office. So you can get a patent in six months, and more importantly, you can be out of the chronological order because we cannot take one before the other one. But this, by this proceeding, we managed to do that. And uh, last, uh, we, the design law, um, we have a very uh, simple system. Our design law was from 1963. It's, it's not like in the US. We don't have substantive examination in designs. We took the, the system from the Germans. So it's simply you file a design application, and there is a formal study, and then they, they grant the, the design. Uh, nowadays, you can have a design in 10 days. So it's a system that has been working very well. But we introduced many changes. The first change was uh, multiple applications will now be allowed uh, on a single filing up to 20 if they belong to the same class of the Locarno classification. The Locarno classification is the international application which is applies to the designs. Uh, no more formal drawings. That was the main reason for office actions, you know, and this is a delay in the, in the procedure for the, for the applicant. Now you can file a photograph, a picture. You simply take your, your phone and take a picture in the different position if it's a three-dimensional object, and that's enough. And there is no doubt what we are, you are claiming. You cannot even uh, need to file a brief description of the design. Then we, uh, we, uh, we uh, allow to defer the publication of the register model up to a maximum of six months. This is important because sometimes novelty uh, destruction may affect uh, the design. And we introduce a grace period to, to pay uh, or for, for for renew the model, the design, uh, which is used in many legislations. Our system allows for two, two renewals. I mean, it's 15 years, but the first is given for five years, and then you renew two times, up to five, 15 years. And uh, the same uh, grace period were introduced in trademark renewal. Now we will provide six months for a grace period to renew the trademark uh, registration, which for any reason the trademark owner forgot to renew. Well, this is, 
a little bit of what the plan, the three main parts of the, of the plan uh, and what we have been doing in the last three years uh, to try to be more efficient, uh, digitalizing the overall of uh, the operation. Uh, we are uh, scanning millions of documents, of papers, you know, to, to really become a paperless office. Today, everything gets uh, a scan. I mean, the applicants still have the possibility to file on paper. It's not denied. We will, we will give a, a, a transition period. Probably next year will be forbidden. But everything with, which goes to the office is scanned. Well, for the U.S. will be like uh, basic, but uh, it's not basic for many offices around the world. Um, well, we are trying to uh, continue training our examiners uh, in the patent and trademark area through cooperation agreements because, unfortunately, we don't have uh, resources. I mean, one of the main uh, problems we have is since last year and until the end of this year, for two years, we are not allowed to hire new employees because we have too many people in the government and the government is trying to reduce the amount of people and the deficit. So when we took office, we have 500 people. Now we have 420, uh, but we have new uh, you have this new uh, opposition procedure. We need more attorneys. Uh, when we took office, we have 80 examiners. Now we have 55. And to train an ex a patent examiners, it takes at least one year, two years minimum. So uh, the lack of human resources is a problem. I mean, but uh, we are trying to. Well, we are we are working. Uh, Still, Argentina is still not a member of PCT. It's incredible, but Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay are not a members. We are working that. Uh, it's not easy because we, are, we, we don't have the majority on the Congress. Uh, but this is something that is being introduced in all the negotiations as a requirement. So PCT will soon be a reality in Argentina. And we would like to have the Madrid Protocol, the international uh, uh, system for registration of trademarks. A, a very good news, Brazil, uh, <coughs> the Brazilian uh, Congress, the deputy, the lower chamber has approved the uh, ratification, uh, addition of uh, Brazil to the Madrid Protocol Treaty. And the commission in the Senate also approved yesterday that so now we have to, it has to go to the plenary of the senate and it will be law in brazil in latin america it's only colombia and mexico well cuba has been a, a member for a long time but uh, i believe that after brazil uh, signing the protocol it will be a kind of domino effect in the whole region and uh, particularly for the practitioners will be important and they will try to push that because the Colombians and the Mexicans, they are getting a lot of experience in the last two or three years. So otherwise the other lawyers in the different countries of Latin America will have a kind of competitive disadvantage. And. Uh, we also try to uh, raise awareness of the importance of uh, IP, you know, uh, for to create, you know, a, a, a good uh, regulatory framework, because, of course, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, small and medium-sized companies was one of the key areas of the government, you know, to to promote the exports of uh, products, innovative products. But you need to have this uh, good re regulatory framework to improve your, um, your IP ecosystem, you know. And we, we uh, set up a, a, a master's uh, degree on, on IP and innovation for the whole Latin American region with WIPO and uh, the University of San Andres. And we have this year another edition of the master, 30 students from all over Latin America. 
Uh, so this is basically what uh, we have been doing in the last three years, and uh, I will be happy to answer any question if there is one after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Damaso. I am glad to hear that uh, the opposition procedure now in Argentina feels a lot more, you know, what we're used to in administrative and quicker, as well as the reduced pendency. But um, next up is going to be Jessica, and we are, I think, are going to come again on the topic of trademark kidnapping. So I hope that is one of the exciting features of today's uh, today's panel is talking about trademark kidnapping. Thank you, Vianney, <laughs> for the word. Um, no, so it was a newspaper. <laughs> it was a newspaper. OK, so nice coin term. Um, so uh, we saw that in Mexico, the, the IP office response on trademark ki um, kidnapping was to institute a use requirement. Uh, Canada, interestingly, is getting rid of its use requirement in about a month. Um, joining Madrid. The United States, which has had a use requirement for a long time, according to the director, uh, is having problems with integrity of the register and people submitting false uh, declarations and based on their auditing of um, post-registration maintenance filings, they're finding that up to half, almost half of declarations that they suspect to be false are actually submitted by attorneys. So anyway, w but we'll talk a little bit uh, about the United States after everyone else. But, um, but I think Jessica is going to address China trademark kidnapping and the fact that China is a registration right country. But I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> New laws are coming to help with, the, uh, with that issue. Okay. And you want to be up here? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you all. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm so excited because it makes me missing my st uh, school life back to eight years. Uh, okay. So um, because Ashley told me that if you can talk about why uh, the trademark application in China is so huge. So uh, I don't know how to explain this, this question, but I think maybe I can share some information or my opinion with you uh, and may help uh, you to understand why we have a lot of trademark applications. Okay, uh, this is from the, just, just the intro, uh, introduction from Ashley. Uh, it's from WIPO. And you can see, so such like 5.74 million, and maybe uh, nine times uh, to US application. Uh, so these are remarkable increase in um, trademark filing in China. So we, we want to know why, uh, why this is the case. So in my opinion, maybe uh, two reasons uh, can make that happen. So the first one is national IP strategy. And the second one is business uh, extension to foreign countries. So as, so as China gives priority to economic development in the uh, recent years, uh, so uh, the country hope that everyone can mm, raise their knowledge or understand of IP. Uh, and also they can have their own brand in the world. But uh, however, the reality is quite the opposite. Only 10% market players uh, with their own marks and uh, a lot of marks, but few world famous. So this is the, uh, the situation in China now. So I think uh, the first reason for that, we, why we have a lot of applications in China, maybe the government encourages everyone to do, to have their own uh, brand. Okay, another reason I think is the business uh, extension to foreign countries. Uh, some of my clients in China, uh, they want to launch their business in other countries. So we have, we all know that we have two options. One is to file Madrid 
application. And then another one is to file, uh, file national application directly to the different countries. So uh, sometimes we, we will choose the, uh, the Madrid because it's, it's cheaper and it's more um, easier, it's, it's easier to, to file. Uh, and for the national application, it may be expensive. So sometimes we, we but, but if we want to file application in Canada before they join the matrix system, so we must choose the, the uh, national application. So this is, uh, I think, the some reason uh, for the, the business extension. So I, I will not explain more about that. Um, but I want to talk some about the China's trademark system. So I want to ask if, uh, if China's system is also a question or a problem to lead the uh, so many applications in China. As many of you may know, in China, we, we based on prior registration. This is a China trademark system. But it's, it's, it's different from US because US is based on uh, actual commercial use. So uh, in my opinion, I think this may be a reason why we have so many applications in China now. Uh, from the, uh, the, the first slide, we know the, uh, in 2017, so the application amount is 5.74 million, but now I think uh, this is the uh, more than 7 million in China last year, 2018. So it's, it's a huge, it's a huge. <laughs> So um, more than 7 million applications in one year and uh, 12 to 15 months to get the registration. That's a long term to get the registration. And intention to be hoarded or resold or trademark scorting is, I think, is the third reason why I think China trademark system may lead the problem of huge application. Um, let me give you an ex example to, to this uh, problem. In November last year, is to, I think it's to um, November last year, and a company filed over 5,000 trademark applications in one day. Wow. And, <laughs> <laughs> and more than, uh, 15,000 application in total in three days. This, this uh, was done by one company. So I think um, maybe you will ask why this is happened, uh, in my opinion, because it's for sale. Um, so I, I just mentioned that we, we need to spend 12 to 15 months to get the registration if everything goes smoothly. So it's a long term for the company to get their mark to be registered. So um, some companies think maybe I can buy a mark from a registered mark and I can use it immediately. So that's uh, such like a business for some company because they want to uh, file applications, they want to register a lot of uh, trademarks and they can sell them. Uh, Maybe it can help some small or startup company because they don't need to wait for one year or more than one year to get the registration uh, and they can buy one, it, it easy. It, of course, if the cost is acceptable. So this may be, I think, the one re reason that there are a lot of trademark applications in China. Um, so I can talk about the new uh, amendment of the China trademark law uh, because I think it's related to the, to the mm, so many huge trademark applications, especially the application filed in bad faith. So this is the main uh, amendment of this uh, time trademark law. So added two 
it's one is any bad faith application for the registration of a trademark that is not intended for use should be rejected. And then another one is a trademark agent should not accept the entrustment of a uh, principal if it knows or should have known that the trademark entrusted by the principal is filed under bad faith or non-use. So um, because we, th this uh, amendment will, be, will come to effect uh, in this uh, November, November 2019. So we, we don't have any ex uh, explanation or regulation about how to use this uh, new law. Um, but I think uh, it may be not very, very easy or very uh, good to use because we need to uh, prove what the bad face is and how to prove the, uh, the trademark applicant uh, is not intent, filed application is not to intend to use. So it's, we, we may need to use some evidence to show that. Uh, and um, I think we can get more information when the law come to effect and we can have more cases and then we can learn more about that. But I think it's, um, it's good for us because uh, you, you have a lot to use. Before the amendment, we don't have any specific law to use it. So this uh, may uh, resolve the problem some. Another uh, revised is the statutory damages. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the law we use the now, uh, it's the statutory damages, uh, three million uh, RMB. I, I, I'm not very good to to say the, the numbers in English, so <laughs> I will not use the USD. And uh, it can, it be changed from uh, th uh, three million uh, million RMB to five million, so it's a high increase. And the compensation uh, calculation is from uh, three times to five times. It's also a very big uh, uh, increase. Uh, OK, so uh, I don't know, can these amendments reduce the trade modification amount? We can see uh, and hope that the, the um, provision of the bad phase can help us to reduce the, the numbers. So maybe I can, I, I just uh, share some information about our new law and maybe can give you some um, thoughts about the, the reason why this is the case. Okay, thank you all. I was gonna say, I have a These so amendments apply to uh, mainland China and Hong Kong, both, because no, they only have to apply in Hong Kong and then uh, no. So uh, mm, the trademark law just can be used in mainland chi China. So we have uh, Hong Kong has their own law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can file application in China directly. You don't need to file uh, the trademark in Hong Kong at first, then to China. No, you can do it directly to China, mainland China. Okay, and there are not going to be any amendments to the Hong Kong? Government? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Okay. Oh, you, you have some, okay. I have a follow-up question while, you're, while we're trading places. Um, so these penalty, so that company you gave as an example, yeah. that registered 15,000 trademarks yeah, in, in three, days. three days. Yes. And they're obviously trademark squatting. It's like cyber squatting, right? Like domain squatting. So, so there's a company that's professionally squatting, probably got investor funding to do so, right? No, no. Um, no I this mostly so. happened when you are spinning off one vertical and to add or increase the valuation of the company. So like we have done in three days, 400 copyright application for an IT company, mm -hmm. okay? So copywriting all of their softwares because they were spinning off that mm -hmm. vertical to bring in investment and funding. Right. So this huh? increased the valuation of the ba basket of IP. Right. I could see that with copyrights, but for yes. trademarks, yeah. it just that's the same thing. It's it's the same same and principles. Four hundred. Yeah. Well, it's four hundred copyrights versus five thousand trademarks. Yeah. Fifteen thousand trademarks. It's just to increase the valuation and of the company. 
So, well, that, that is the case. It's not the case to the uh, the example I just mentioned. Oh, I can you use your mic? It, it, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I think the company may have some investment, but the investment is to sell the trademark to mm -hmm. get more money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, under the new law, what struck me was the damages. <laughs> yeah. So. Half a million U.S. dollar equivalent, uh, um, up to seven hundred fifty thousand U.S. dollar equivalent, <clears throat> is that? And I saw that the penalties for a bad faith registration go to it appears to both the applicant as well potentially to the agent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Just um, yes. yes. So. Um, so just yes. So uh, so Jessica, how does that make you feel as an agent in China for your exposure? Um, um, so yeah. I think because I, I also have my own firm and we are agent for our client. Um, I think the 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 amendment just want to prevent some maybe bad agents because yeah. they 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 help their client to file the trademark. Uh, uh, squatting the, 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 the trademarks, mm -hmm. um, but for us, we, we need to be very careful, careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need to maybe talk to our client. If, if I don't know that mark is other's mark mm -hmm. and I filed it for my client, it may be a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know this amendment, mm, how this amendment can be used. So we need to, to see more case. Sorry, what, Sarkis? Liability insurance. Yeah, liability exactly. Insurance. That's my yeah, thought. Exactly. I, I feel like your um, malpractice insurance uh -huh. is going to be going up um, in China. Maybe. That's that's my thought. So, okay, yes. So in the U.S., I like I have a lot of my clients sign statement use. Yeah. So like I send the link to them and have them sign it, not me, because I don't have access to what they're telling me. Is in it. I know a lot of practitioners sign it themselves, right. but they I don't know if this will somehow help because then you know if, if they're signing it, you're not signing it. But they're telling you. You need to collect the evidence from the client before you submit it, and you have to have it use a judgment as a professional to see if the evidence is sufficient. Like I, I had actually a question to me in how was in Mexico, but in the United States, to have, for example, a website of offering for sale is not enough. You have to be able to have a cash register with actually that actually affect the purchase. But I mean, but, you know, there's so, a of time in, in looking. So, like I said, for the yeah. U.S., you have the option of sending the link to your client. You know, and some practitioners, well, they don't really understand it anyway. Like, right. well, that doesn't help. You right. Know? And so, when you're doing the statement of use, yeah. I was just going to say for the live streaming audience, because you don't have a, a mic on, I just wanted to summarize. So that so the the question it started out with. Gee, if you just have your client sign the statement of use, can you avoid the seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollar liability? And then it, it morphed into, is that a good practice or not? Which, it, which I certainly have plenty of comments. I, which, anyway, lots of good discussion on that, Damaso. No, just to mention, we have uh, one provision similar, identical provision in our law in 1981, because people were filing trademark to sell them and make money. And it was exactly the same. And the last, of course, this uh, disencouraged the people who were doing this practice. Uh, I, I will not uh, care about the problem of uh, insurance or whatever. I mean, it's act <laughs> against the law. One of my last cases before getting to the public sector was an Argentine company negotiating the recovering of a trademark in China. It was an important winery. And they ask for half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the amount of money is, is similar to what uh, they get for, from each trademark. So I think it's fantastic. I mean, very good solution. Yeah. It will work. OK, so uh, just you mentioned that you can send the link to the client. They need to sign, uh, sign it by themselves. But in China, we don't need to file any declaration of the use. So, so that's. We, we cannot do that. Uh, I need to clarify. You just mentioned that the compensation is a high, huge amount that. Mm -hmm. So that compensation or damage is uh, only for the um, trademark infringement case. 
so it's not for for oh. the agent. No, okay. No, no. It's just for the infringement case. Oh, yeah. so I think okay. we we may have some uh, punishment to the agent, but I don't know what mm. it okay. should be. Yeah. I okay. I don't think they will need to pay so many money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rebecca. Okay, so, so my question is: You had mentioned bad faith and needing evidence to show bad faith. Do you have any feeling for what that evidence would be? And let's say you're Coca-Cola, and there's some third party trying to register clearly a bad faith mark in in China, um, because it's not coming from the Coca-Cola company. How does the how does the Chinese trademark office? recognize that, or does a third party have to come in and point that out to the trademark office? Um, and just, I'm just going to repeat for the lack, okay, and so the question is, is there a standard on bad faith, uh, what, what uh, amount of evidence would be required for and basically, how does, it, how does it happen at the trademark office? And, and what's the procedure at the trademark office? Yeah, yeah, I know. So uh, for the bad faith, if, uh, uh, so we, we don't have some a specific uh, regulation to, to say what the bad faith is. Uh, but sometimes we will file some of the application, uh, uh, evidence such, such like uh, maybe this company, just like that one, they, they file a lot of trademark and not for use. And maybe they file uh, some trademark similar to the uh, famous brand, just like Coca-Cola. Uh, this may, may help the, the um, the office to, to understand, understand this. And uh, another one is um, if the, the trademark applicant, they um, contact others to sell the mark, it mm -hmm. also can be an evidence. Be evidence. Yeah, 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 yeah. It mm -hmm. sounds like the evidence is similar to anti-cyber squatting. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, um, all right, Mahua, would you like to come talk about New developments in India. I know we've had a lot of um, new law changes <laughs> so far. Hi. I apologize to all my jet lagged friends, especially <laughs> flying <laughs> from China with 12 hours of time difference. Please bear with me. I will try to make this boring topic a little bit more interesting. Um, India is on the watch list of uh, US for one of the most notorious country. Uh, we are not just the one. There are around 36 such countries uh, who are on the 301 list of US along with USSR, China, uh, Turkey. Uh, so we are not just alone there. Now taking it positively, it is good for IP professionals because we still have a lot of reforms to do, a lot of bilateral agreements to be executed by the government. And we as a lawyer have to keep on working towards that. Um, I was part of INTA, uh, Trademark Office Practice Committee, um, two years for Asia and subsequent two years for India. Drafted several um, proposals and papers on behalf of INTA and submitted that. I don't know uh, whether that paid off or the Trump arm twisting India paid off. We have uh, a <laughs> reform you know, which came up in 2016 and um, we saw a lot of change as the government changed in 2014. Uh, the government uh, led by our Prime Minister Modi, he just came and said anything and everything to do with IP so that you know, India is one of the most favored nation for India entry and attracting um, um, business in India. And he was all over pushing all the, um, all the departments I know. Even Indian Space Research Organization, we once received a call from them. And it seems the Prime Minister's office have indicated all the scientists to collect all the innovations which are not being used to sell off. So valuation and you know extracting value of even space research innovations and it was all you know uh, rippling to all the uh, departments and there were a lot of things which happened with regard to ip so i have to use this is that no, no is yeah, it the little one sorry yeah so yeah, yeah. okay yeah so um, one of the key changes which happened is um, 
initially we had several other you know departments uh, having different ip like copyright was under ministry of human resources i don't know why because they handle the education part so on those old days it was like because copyright is something to do with education and all and trademark and patent where was and the ministry of commerce new government um, opened up a new department under ministry of commerce and consolidated all ip and very much ip focused they opened a new portal for foreign direct investment and put ip also as one of the portal over there for anybody looking and coming to india can directly go to that portal and that department and you know works easier now there are certain things which the government did i am giving you an overall view and picture and not just targeting uh, one subject of ip uh, now research and development which you know uh, 20 years back was not such a, a priority for the indian corporates so now as a corporate social responsibility under the companies act research and development have been pushed to foster and to culture to open innovation uh, one of the foundation of the president of india is national innovation foundation we are working for as a pro bono where the you know the root level innovation maybe a farmer found a better way to irrigate his field or maybe he innovated and modified a motorcycle into a irrigation tractor the government is helping those root level innovators uh, to file patents for them and they approach some of our law firms to help the government and help this you know root level uh, innovators which we are doing as a pro bono work for the government of india then um, there were several campaigns which were launched uh, for ip awareness and um, i can uh, you know say that one of them was to compete with china i know it may take couple of decades for us to compete with china and the manufacturing uh, level of china um, it's a long way for us to go but one of the campaign was make in india means if you have an ip and you say i have the ip then it cannot be just you are importing that product and selling that product in india so indian government is pushing those companies that you manufacture in india which has multi pronged benefits uh, in you know increasing indian employments and that promise that yes um, we will give you better protection if you manufacture in india and that even our um, you know patent law also come in where you have to file uh, in use that you are not only just holding a patent registration but you are using that patent in india and you have to file a certificate or or an undertaking every year in india so these are some of the campaigns like creative india innovative india make in india digital india skill india uh, startup india like there are lot of because of technology um you know there was a joke in my firm that every second client who is walking in say we are a startup company means they don't want to pay much to okay but it was because um, the government initiated a uh, you know scheme that if you are a startup company you will get you know concessional rate for registering your ip a fast fast track expeditious process for you but you have to be first recognized as a startup company so these are lot of things um, which the government took initiatives to promote ip and promote um, um, trade yeah so the national ip policy um, was uh, introduced in may 2016 but implemented in may in implemented in march 2017 and uh, we saw uh, you know lot of encouragement and stress provided on design related ip and that's a domain which is now uh, quite a lot increase you see all the 3d designs with 3d printing and all so design is something the new thing the the next thing you know and encourage geographical indication now we have lot of um, a list of geographical indications and so the gi producers should you know maintain a standard so there has been society set up 
where they have to be assisted, the local traders who want the geographical indications to be maintained. Like when I say geographical indication, I don't know how many of you have that in your country. It's like um, Darjeeling tea, that is one of the <coughs> geographic uh, indication. I know you will find Darjeeling tea in US also, and that is trademark kidnapping. <laughs> okay, so um, so infusion they of have funds. have kill in China. Yes, of course. Um, I know. <laughs> Basmati rice, that is also trademark kidnapping. Okay, so US does get trademark kidnapping as well. Um, <laughs> And so um, to take steps to increase domestic filings in India. And uh, so a lot of uh, corporates were encouraged to do that. And the government recruited a lot of trademark agents because there was a um, lot of trademark, sorry, trademark examiners because there were a lot of backlog over there. So by 2018, we saw more than 400 examiners being appointed and many positions being you know, sanctioned. Then the government started providing tax benefits and financial support to the IP generated from public funded research. And those IPs would be treated as mortgageable assets. So we can see a valuation of IP and transaction based on IP are coming up. And um, we are, yes, of course we say that for a long, long years that we are in compliance with WTO and TRIPS, but what US and other countries are looking at us at beyond uh, WTO and TRIPS. Um, so we signed um, some of the treaties like WIPO internet treaties uh, in July 2018 and WIPO copyright treaty and WIPO performance and uh, phonogram treaty. So we, filed, uh, we signed all those treaties. Then um, we, they have stringent measure for dot .in domain, dot .in, that is for India domain and for you know immediate tech town then numerous uh, states of india setting up ip crime units to combat the menace of internet piracy so all this there are a lot of changes happening maybe uh, because of the uh, pressure of this government now i take quickly to you to three cases which are uh, landmark cases you can say uh, in india one of them was um, standard essential uh, you know for patent I don't know how many of you are from patent uh, field. Now, standard essential um, is that feature where without that standard essential feature, the innovation in that field or that domain cannot grow. So here it was of a Philip DVD where they had this analog for you know a playback. Now, whoever wants to manufacture a DVD, they cannot do it without licensing this patent from Philip. The defendant out here, they brought the, you know, um, uh, the component uh, from some other country and they brought it to India. So one of their defense was uh, doctrine of exhaustion, that if I have bought it from any other country who was a, a licensee, it means your IP has already exhausted. So, uh, but they could not prove it um, and they could not establish uh, their purchase. So this, the court came up and they recognized Philip's um, essential patents and they accepted the certifications of uh, ISO and EPEC in this. And that was a landmark judgment um, with regard to patent law. Now with regard to trademark, you can say this was, for some trademark practitioners, this was, you can say, a little bit set back um, because we adopted a well-known mark or famous mark as a statutory provision long back. But in this case, um, it was of Toyota Pira's car and uh, Prius car, and there was another company who adopted that trademark. Uh, though the high court, that's a federal court, ruled in favor of Toyota, on appeal, the Supreme Court said that at the time when the defendant adopted the mark, whether you had enough goodwill in this country because of the territorial, you know, IP being a territorial right. Even if you are saying that you are a well-known mark today, but at the time of the adoption where you so well-known that the defendant would have known about it. So you have to establish your goodwill at that time of adoption and Toyota lost this case in the Supreme Court of India. Now, this is another judgment on copyright society. Um, 
we had lot of notorious copyright society in india i did some of the cases against them as well uh, where it is um, completely um, you can say unruly of copyright society there is no standard of royalty uh, how they are you know collected what is the basis of royalty copyright societies as you know need to be registered um, and approved and licensed by the indian government but um, they converted themselves into company and we they said we come under uh, you know licensing as well and if the copyright owners have licensed us directly then we can sub license and that's that we do not come under society so there was a big war between the copyright society the so called copyright society and the government of india now this was one of the case where um, uh, court said that the copyright society can fix their own royalty and uh, their the copyright board uh, can scrutinize that and anybody who are aggrieved can approach the copyright board and uh, you know they can say that there should be a standard and yardstick for royalty so these are the three cases thank you hope i could wake up some of you thank you thank you Yeah, okay. Well, I'm just uh, get out of your chair. Sorry. Oh, there's mine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, let me get your slides on there. So, I, guess, I think Sarkis is going to stand up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thank you all. Any questions while I'm displaying Armenia? No. No. Armenia. All right. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, sure. Why Armenia matters? <laughs> why what? Why Armenia matters? Why Armenia oh, at all? Why, why we're matters. discussing Armenia? I mean, uh, how many of uh, you here filed any trademark or patent application in Armenia? No. That's what I'm asking. Why then I'm speaking about Armenia here? Um, not only that I'm a graduate of Franklin Pierce, and that is why I appear here, not only that we cooperate with, uh, cooperated with Franklin Pierce UNH School of Law, and we hope to continue our cooperation. Uh, and not only uh, that is the reason why I'm here, uh, but the reason here is um, that small countries sometimes are used um, to enter into bigger markets um, without any uh, trademark or patent or other IP infringements uh, getting to the bigger, bigger mar markets. Uh, Armenia is one of those countries uh, after becoming a member of the Eurasian Customs Union. Um, in 2014, uh, when uh, the Eurasian Customs Union was formed by Russia, uh, Belarus, and Ka uh, Kazakhstan, later joined by Armenia and Kyrgyzstan, um, removed basically the uh, customs uh, the borders between these countries, which means um, if you import your goods uh, into Armenia, um, and then you can freely go to Russia, go to Belarus, go to Kazakhstan, to the bigger markets uh, in the region without any customs clearance. So if you don't have a registered trademark in Armenia, um, then the customs office would not be able to support you to uh, you know, protect your interests. The goods might be imported simply to Armenia and then they end up in uh, bigger markets uh, freely without any customs clearance. But uh, before getting to uh, you know, those legal issues, uh, I wanted to first of all thank uh, Franklin Pierce for, uh, and I'm saying Franklin Pierce because I'm, I'm a graduate of Franklin Pierce. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, currently, University of New Hampshire School of Law. Um, I'm so happy that you know Franklin Pierce uh, changed my career, uh, changed my life, and uh, hopefully uh, the skills, the knowledge that I uh, received from this school will change my country as well. I think we're on that direction now. Um, 
I'm a graduate of uh, 2009, as I said. Uh, I struggled for about 10 years to promote IP in Armenia. Um, we, we had two governments, uh, two presidents, uh, basically, for about 20 years that um, paid no attention to this field. Um, IP rights were ignored totally. Um, the representatives from this school, Ashlyn Lambry, uh, Stan Kowalski, assisted me with several projects uh, in Armenia. Didn't help, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, up to 2018, when uh, we had this so-called Velvet Revolution um, in Armenia, um, where there was a complete change of the uh, former government with the uh, new government. And the new government today fully supports uh, all the projects in the field of IP. And um, as you know, I don't know how many of you here know about the uh, location of Armenia. If you know, raise your hand. I, I don't think there will be <laughs> many. Um, it's, it's, it's between basic, basically Asia and Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. You know about that. <laughs> Uh, that's good. Uh, um, it's between Asia and Europe, uh, basically. Uh, Armenia is a very, very old country, uh, one of the oldest countries. Uh, we count the history from Noah, Noah's Ark. Uh, if you heard about uh, Mountain Ararat and uh, Noah's Ark, so uh, there were Armenians. Um, and that's where Armenian uh, history begins. And we were there for, from those days <laughs> <laughs> and never moved to any other place. Um, now, um, coming back to the IP-related legal issues, uh, as I said, after the change of the government and after the revolution, um, now the government pushes for reforms, and those who were pushing for remo or, uh, reforms from the IP community, they uh, try to keep up with the pace that the government now dictates, um, uh, which means we need some more people involved in this field to uh, make real changes. And why I mentioned about the geography, geographical location of Armenia. Armenia is a landlocked country. Um, we don't have any access to the sea, um, and we didn't have for a very long time. Um, the only resource, real resource that we have is the human resource, human capital. And we have um, thousands of years of history of innovative nation that uh, supported with uh, its innovations, uh, brought the innovations to the world. Not only uh, the innovations were uh, made in Armenia, but also outside of Armenia. Uh, you'll find uh, inventors in almost all countries, Armenian inventors, uh, the famous ones. But uh, the new government understands the importance of the human capital, human resource. There is a big emphasis on the protection of uh, IP rights. We managed to organize a big conference this year on the, uh, this year on the World IP Day. Uh, with the participation of the prime minister, the leader of the basically country, the leader of the uh, movement. Um, who uh, sent the message to the world that Armenia now is uh, uh, the place where IP is not only respected, but uh, we need to protect IP, we need to promote creative activities, we need to uh, provide uh, uh, incentives to creators in order to create a knowledge-based economy in Armenia. So this is a totally new uh, approach. Uh, it brings uh, new values uh, to the country, and I think uh, we're, we're going back to our roots, uh, supporting uh, innovators, supporting creators. Um, coming uh, to the legal issues, we, um, we do have a legislation, IP legislation, conformed uh, with the European uh, standards. So Armenian legislation is more uh, uh, similar to the European. Um, and there is a big question now where we should go if we're uh, creating a knowledge-based economy uh, you know what should be uh, more important uh, what fields uh, what emphasis should be uh, uh, put on what, what fields how we should go forward now uh, there is a question about ip strategy um, and we need unh uh, school of law support uh, on developing maybe an IP uh, strategy
for Armenia. There, there are talks about um, uh, creating, uh, making Armenia as a hub, IP hub in the region. And we need Stan Kowalski's support. Uh, he was uh, with us uh, trying to promote those ideas um, uh, in Armenia. We need him back. Uh, we are trying to create a coordination body, IP coordination body uh, in Armenia, because we have only a, a PTO, uh, Patent Trademark Office, and everyone looks at the PTO like the body state authority that knows everything in the field of IP and does everything in the field of IP, but that's not the case. There are enforcement related issues that, um, you know, dealt. Um, uh, by uh, that are uh, uh, th that is the work of the police or the customs office or uh, the courts. Uh, so the PTO has nothing to do with that. Now um, uh, there is lack of uh, awareness in the field of IP uh, among all stakeholders uh, in the higher level, in the government level, in the lower level. Uh, the right holders themselves, uh, in many cases, many times, do not know what their what the rights are. Therefore, uh, we are thinking about creating a coordination body which will, first of all, coordinate the work of all uh, state authorities um, and will implement basically the potential IP strategy to be developed for Armenia. Now, um, uh, coming back to the Eurasian Customs Union, um, we now see increase uh, of uh, filing trademark applications uh, in Armenia and uh, filing customs applications uh, in Armenia uh, for that very reason that I mentioned initially. Um, Armenia becomes it's a small country uh, that nobody would pay attention to before and we have cases like Burger King, uh, Victoria's Secret, um, uh, Toyota Lexus uh, that we were fighting uh, to protect their rights for, for a decade. Uh, which became much easier today. The courts became more objective. The judgments are much more objective today than uh, used to be. The police um, and the customs office started the work. <laughs> they started enforcement. Um, and now, since there's a um, big threat to the illegal use of the brand uh, through the import, Many companies file trademark applications in Armenia to protect the marks, the products on the border. And this is a, a very effective way. We tested the law. We thought that we have a pretty good law in place, you know, in conformity with the European standards. But while testing the law, uh, we uh, notified some uh, uh, problems as well. But the good news is that we are in cooperating, we cooperate with the government and every single issue that we identify while enforcing, while protecting the IP rights, the government uh, quickly uh, responds and we uh, solve uh, those issues. Um, and we try to amend the legislation, am am amend all uh, the uh, gaps we see in the law uh, very quickly. So there is a big support and this uh, helps the right holders to quickly solve the, uh, uh, their IP issues in Armenia. And again, uh, just uh, to remember that this is a uh, way uh, for uh, you know, uh, infringement of uh, IP rights in other countries. And uh, we're trying to be the border, uh, trying to protect the interests on the border uh, of Armenia. Um, I think I covered uh, most of the topics uh, that I had. Um, but if you have any questions, please yeah. go ahead. This is nothing to do with uh, how it's done in Armenia. I just <laughs> want to know, Sergeant, what was going through your mind when you decided to talk so fast if uh, IP was not an issue back then? Oh, thank you very much for the question, actually. <laughs> um, can you I repeat the question? Yes. Uh, why? Why did I? Why did I decide to specialize in IP? Basically, why I came all the way from Armenia to UNH to study IP. Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> um, I practiced IP since 2002, um, um, and I had a problem. I had two issues in my mind. I wanted to specialize in some field because I was not satisfied with the you know general practice. Uh, and I wanted to do something good for the country. 
by practicing law. Uh, in 2008, when I was a finalist of so-called Muskie program, exchange program, a government-funded program, uh, the government, the U.S. government, has chosen this law school for me to uh, uh, study. I have never heard about Franklin Pierce before, and I was about to uh, refuse. Uh, I was about to, you know, just decline uh, this proposal because I, I was not able to choose. The government would choose for me, um, and I wanted to take business courses. Uh, I went through the website. I noticed that there are some business courses. Uh, eventually, I said, "Well, well, let's give a try. Uh, I'll go to Franklin Pierce and find, you know, choose the business law courses." But when I uh, did some more research, when I decided to come, I did some more research, and some people, at, at say good people, right people at the right moment, gave me some good suggestions to choose IP <laughs> <laughs> courses, and I had to choose some at least. Uh, I honestly fell in love, uh, first of all, with this field. Uh, that's how it changed my career, and that's how I understood that this is the field that I like, and this is the field that would bring something good to my country. And this is the field that needs to be developed in my country. Um, so when I graduated, uh, it was fascinating that uh, my background in the business law and the education LM in IP at Franklin Pierce gave me that um, uh, confidence to uh, practice IP uh, open up a law firm and practice IP in Armenia. Well, I received a uh, proposal from the Minister of Economy back then, right after graduation, to uh, do some uh, work on the draft trademark law, which I did. I gave 25 pages opinion uh, uh, on the draft trademark law. Uh, some, uh, some part of it was accepted, not all. Uh, but right after that, when I felt like there's nothing else to do here, I decided to uh, start my own practice. That was in 2010, uh, in September of 2010. And that's when I opened up my law firm. Uh, later in 2011, uh, established the Intellectual Property Rights Center of Armenia, which does a lot of social projects in this field in Armenia. Um, uh, raises awareness, uh, organizes various seminars, competitions for law students, etc. And um, I was hoping, I, I mean, I was sure that at some point the government will understand the importance of IP, the importance of enforcement, the importance of uh, providing incentives to creators and uh, authors. I was sure, but I, don't, I wasn't aware when it will happen. And there was a problem actually in 2016 or 17 when, when I was about to leave Armenia because I was, uh, sure that you know the government will never understand the importance and the 2018 revolution you know totally changed the whole uh, system and uh, the government and the approach and we have this new fresh government with this full understanding of the importance of uh, providing incentives to creators and protection of ip rights but my students and i was teaching since uh, I have been teaching since 2006 at the American University of Armenia. And after my graduation here, I started teaching IP. My students nowadays are in the government, are in the parliament, and they are pushing forward, uh, you know, uh, the development of IP. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we, it, it basically means that at least the past 10 years of teaching <laughs> uh, was a little helpful. <laughs> and thank you again very much to uh, Franklin Pierce University of New Hampshire School of Law for changing my career, for changing my life, and hopefully uh, the uh, country, Armenia. Thank you. So we are like definitely out of time, and I, intended to have some time for questions and I also wanted to flip in front of you two updates in the United States. I thought that's being narrow. So uh, Canada, June 17th, joining Madrid. Enough said, okay, everybody knows that. Um, <laughs> United States, um, there's a new rule likely to come into play. Right now, it's not yet in, a fo in force. Comments were submitted last month. 
Um, and what it will require is uh, if you are a non-US applicant, registrant, or party before uh, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board for a preceding opposition cancellation, you must have a U.S. attorney represent you. Mm -hmm. Currently, the, and there, uh, so it was currently, uh, this impacts about, on an annual basis, about uh, 50, 51,000 uh, applications. Um, and what the office doesn't know yet, the USPTO office doesn't know yet, is whether, um, it, whether they'll, they'll defer examination on a new application or not. So I don't know. But, but uh, you might start making some contacts at INTA starting tomorrow or tonight, today, <laughs> for your U.S. colleagues here, right? Um, because you're going to need a U.S. associate um, if you don't already have one. Okay. And then um, a couple of fun facts that you guys probably won't use. But um, uh, the disparaging marks are now registrable in the United States because part of the Lanham Act was held, the, our Trademark Act was held unconstitutional. And currently, um, we are looking at the, the US Supreme Court heard oral argument on April 15th and is considering whether to also render unconstitutional a prohibition on registration of basically swear words or dirty pictures. Is, I, yeah, good. Night. We, we didn't need to give all the examples. Um, and then lastly, I mean, I really did have to talk about Brexit. Brexit. I, and we were going to invite comments from the audience at this, because we don't have anyone on the panel. But all I got to say is October, Halloween this year. Halloween. Halloween. We're going to maybe no more. Deal, no deal. Are we going to work out a deal? Anyway, how do we feel? <laughs> is it going to be scary? Brexit is going to be scary. Um, so I'll, uh, if, if there's interest, certainly let's, um, any, does anyone have questions or want to talk about, yes, go ahead. I have a comment there regarding Brexit. Yes, uh, go right ahead. After the UK leaves the uh, European Union, if. Ireland would be the only if. country that would kind of speak English. But they may decide that the language is actually self. So at that point, English will cease to be an uh, official language of the European Union. Oh. Oh. At that point, it could be that they will have to decide whether Spanish should be. Oh, muy bien. Oh. Oh. But anyways, okay. uh, the, point is, the point is that uh, English may cease to be a European language. Shocker. Okay, so um, for anyone who didn't, um, for the live stream or the recording, so the comment, if, what's your name? Mario. Mario. Mario said that if uh, if uh, e English if upon Brexit, English could f um, cease to be an official language of the EU IPO. And right now, I utilize I utilize that if I have a distinctiveness refusal in a specific country. So, like um, in Germany or France or you know any other non English speaking country, if I file direct. They're going to take a harder view on distinctiveness than an EU, or excuse me, an English-speaking examiner. So, I didn't. Thank you, Mario. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, any anyone else? I, we have so many countries. I know we didn't even begin to uh, go. It's time for the cocktails. <laughs> all right. I think that's a wonderful comment. And finally, can we all have a round of thank you applause? Hey. We are so lucky. Um, yeah. These uh, IP founder, firm founders and IP agency, you know, presidents uh, that we have, <laughs> we are lucky enough to have. So, and all their knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.